Thank you all for coming, and I, uh, I thank B&H, the event space, and uh, and B&H, uh, Joel Lowy is uh, my contact here, and he's been very kind to to be in, engaged with me in a number of different projects that we're working on together, and uh, it's ha I'm happy to be here. So I've been shopping at this store since it was a little store down in the photo district um, before they built this space, so it's uh, it's an interesting uh, interesting to be here in this in this capacity. So. Um, I'm going to walk you through a little bit what we're going to do. Um, it's also nice to be here in New York because I, I speak about food photography in a lot of venues and I, I very rarely get an opportunity to speak at home. So it's really nice to be here in New York and have a different audience. And a lot of the stuff that I do in different cities, I, I get a lot of the same audience. And this seems very different to me, a very d diverse group of people. Probably how many people here are actively engaged in food photography? Yeah, so that, that's interesting to me. So I'm glad that you're here, and I hope that uh, you come away with something. And like I said, I'm going to leave ample opportunity at the end for Q&A, and I'm in no hurry to run off at the end if you have any other questions. So uh, without uh, any further chatter, I will begin. So my, my slideshow here is, um, I know this is about compositional and lighting basics, but it's probably going to go a little deeper than that, and we're going to talk about things going through here and how I approach food photography. And this is sort of like a, a view into my process in a lot of ways. So food photography begins with component parts. If you don't have beautiful things to shoot, it becomes harder to make beautiful pictures. But the simplest things have kind of beauty to them that you kind of want to recognize and incorporate into your pictures. And sometimes, the idea that something so small and so simple can be really beautiful is part and parcel to what we do in food photography. It is ultimately an art form that really gravitates toward the macro and the small details, like we talked about earlier before we got started. So smaller, this is, oh boy, anyway. There's a couple of pictures in here that I resized that didn't come out just right, but we'll skip over them. Um, you know, and those small, tiny little details that kind of evoke emotion, color palette, the component parts of anything we, we shoot has to begin with beauty and recognizing beauty and maybe in places that you don't always see it. So, and light plays on objects and light is one of your component parts too. It's a big part of it. Light and shadow, which we'll have a little bit more of a section of, is really about recognition, is looking and seeing where you want to use light and shadow to tell the story that you're interested in telling. And approaching things from different angles, but again, the, beginning, the beginnings of beautiful things. Come on up front. OK. So. With food photography, ultimately, we're, we're, we're always trying to tell a story. We're trying to start somewhere and bring our reader to another place, another time, another memory, another, another experience. Because food ultimately is experiential and something we share. So if we're looking at this from a storytelling perspective, we want to use every element that we have to tell the story. So in order to kind of use process shots as your kind of storytelling device, you still want to make them beautiful. They don't have to be as, in my estimation, they don't have to be as literal as artistic. You know, and when you put people's hands in the photograph, you want to make sure that the hands, another component part, are at least something that is going to not distract the viewer, if not be the main focus of, for the viewer. Um, you know, this is as much artistic as it is procedural. And a lot of times when we move through the storytelling idea procedurally, we lose that art, artist, artistry. We lose the idea of light and shadow. And I feel like when you take time to plot out, maybe storyboard, maybe think about things in a narrative flow, motion without the motion, you have the idea that you can kind of have this continuum of photographs that lead you down the path to the end of the story. So the way food moves, the way we handle food, and then also tying things together. 
So when you have this, which is very simple, we have white on white and with more white, but we bring color and, and shadow with the little red handle or, or the plaid in the blue shirt. And then when we go to here, we have all those elements still. We have the red, we have the blue. Now we have a finished product and we're, we're still traveling down that road in, in a storytelling mode. And then we get closer. Again, thinking cinematically in a way, push and pull, moving in, pulling away, giving context, showing beauty. This is this, the idea of storytelling with, with images alone. Without having to write a word for this story, I think that this series of images gives you the idea as to where we begin and where we're going, and we added an element of romance to it, something that I bring to this because pizza is something that's cultural for me. Pizza is something that is cultural for a lot of people, but it's also something that's really enjoyable for people outside of Italian culture. So you're sharing a little bit of myself, the romance of it for me, and then bringing it to a beautiful picture that is ultimately something that you want to eat. Because I don't know that we want to eat raw dough, but there was still something compelling about it. And that's the idea of storytelling with food images. Again, we're here. We're making beautiful pictures. The carton isn't necessarily something that you want to show all the time, but the idea is it's still on a path. We're still, we're still walking down it, showing these small details. Again, the push and pull, the cinematic feel of, of, of a series of images. And then we kind of get to a final. And if you see a pattern emerging here with my style, we're going to get to that a little bit more. But I have a tendency to be on the darker side and use shadow a little bit more than maybe some other photographers in our space do. But the idea is that that's the style that I've been influenced by. And it's something that I worked on and, and created over time that I'm comfortable in. The darker palette allows for me the colors of food to jump, to pop off the screen. And when you have things that are a single image, something that is evocative, you can tell a story. This, is, this was part of a story about um, black and white cookies. Again, a cultural reference for people who have experiences with this type of food who want to romanticize it in a way. And that drip is about selling emotion. See that? How you like that for timing? <laughs> I know my slideshow. <laughs> when we are being photographers in the food space, we are sell salesmen, saleswomen, salespeople. We are selling emotion to our customers, clientele, to the general public. Food is hugely emotional, and if you tap the right notes, if you strike the right chords, everybody can feel it. There's something about the way food moves, the way that a drip or a drop or a smoke plume or something that makes it visceral, that makes it three-dimensional. The challenge in food photography is to make something that is innately three-dimensional appear that way on a two-dimensional surface. Food is three-dimensional art. And where people ask me, where are the influences? The influences are in three-dimensional art. Because quite honestly, that has no meaning if it's flat. It has to feel real. It has to feel almost like you could reach through the screen. So compositionally, I yes, I am putting it in the middle of my frame. And I have this kind of symmetrical balance. But ultimately, what I want to you to understand and conceptualize first before we start talking about X's and O's is the thought, the, the feeling that goes into putting food on a plate in front of a camera. Why do I do it? Why do I, what do I want to make sure at the other end is the result? And mmm, I want to eat that. That's the result. That's the emotion. So when you, when you feel it, when you see it, and you know what's happening next, Right? You're building that narrative in your mind. You're building the narrative that says, I want to see that drip, and the next thing I want to do is put the spoon in it. And I want to put it in, and I, want, and I know exactly what that's going to taste like. I want to feel it. That's the emotion. The sizzle, the smoke, 
the, the thing that makes food real for us, the things that we experience. You walk into a house in the, in the, uh, in the cold winter and you smell what's coming out of the kitchen. It draws you in. It makes you feel. It makes you think and remember. That's what food photography has to be in order for it to be something that has kind of a fulfillment to it, just like eating. It's, there's there's, there's a, a real fulfillment to experiencing it. And then, you know, hopefully if it's something that you want, you're going to get it. What does the drip make you think about? What's next? Licking it, right? It's everybody's experience with an ice cream cone. It's universal. And, and the, it's being able to capture that moment. That, and why it's important. Why is it important is because it's something we can all relate to. If you can relate to it, if you can experience it in your real world, this brings you there. It brings you into that mindset, into that space, into that great time when you were a child, whatever, or with your child. There's always something com you know, contextually important. That's when you can sell that emotion. you know. Now, there's not a whole lot that's sexy about a buckwheat pancake, right? <laughs> but there's something about the sizzle and the smoke that makes me think about something, puts me in a, in a, in a Sunday, on a Sunday morning somewhere, you know? So that's part of that selling of emotion. Same thing, you know? It's, it's all about finding that one tiny little detail sometimes that makes you think. Why do they do this in every Twix commercial? <laughs> Why? They do it because it resonates. It makes people think and feel because something like the viscosity of caramel is consistent. It's real that people can relate to because when you're making it, eating it, working with it, it always has this consistency. It's reliable. And that's why a shot like that works for people because it's a really reliable experience. And then, of course, there's always the end. <laughs> right? And that's something, too, that people relate to. And that these pictures that you see very often in food photography about that, the, 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 the bitter end, you know, there's something bittersweet about getting to the end of something really delicious that re also resonates with people emotionally. You know, the movement aspect. This doesn't have to be moving to, to show you that it has a dynamic feel to it. Then the dynamic aspect of food photography and keeping things moving and flowing is really, I think, important in the narrative because, again, it's not flat. It's not static. It is, is two-dimensional, and it is not moving. But this is anything but static. OK. Light and color. This is where it all happens. That's it. It's a little window with north face exposure. A nice, I have probably, I have better uh, diffusion now. This is a very old picture. Uh, a couple of sole horses, a lot of different surfaces that I use as tabletops, and a camera stand, which is not mandatory. You can do with a tripod, you can stand on a ladder. You, I've done all of those things and continue to do all those things when I'm too lazy to put the camera on the stand. But I show this picture because I want people to understand that there doesn't have to be an enormous production to make something beautiful. Tabletop photography is about this big. That's it, two by three. And everything, you can create entire worlds, universes, on a two by three tabletop for this type of photography. And if you have some decent light or can create some decent light, and you have an idea as to what story you want to tell, you could tell it on that space with a nice, some nice orientation, a couple of bounce cards, and a camera. And the camera you own, the one in your pocket, the one you got in your bag, it's the best piece of equipment you own. Know how to use it and use it well. Doesn't mean you don't need to be shooting a you know a, a Hasselblad with you know a, a lens on it this long. You need to use the camera you have and use it well. That's the important part. But that's it, and it's simple and it's recreatable for a lot of you. Chase the light. Simple objects is what still life photography is about. It's about playing light off of objects, 
and understanding it. This is backlit with a little bit of front fill, maybe a couple of white cards on the, on the camera side. And I'm, my light source is directly behind me. So this is kind of that idea of using light as the star. Because there's nothing innately desirable about an onion skin. But there is something beautiful about the way the light plays on it. And that's an experiment in tabletop photography. It's, it's the way you approach objects that maybe aren't necessarily really naturally beautiful or desirable, but the way light plays off them might be. And it's a good frame of mind to put yourself in as a tabletop food photographer that this is how light can be used, particularly things where light can penetrate. Drama, drama, as we say in New York. We have a lot of drama here, right? And this is the style that I've kind of worked on over the years, and it's influenced by painting, and it's influenced by architecture, and it's influenced by a lot of different art forms. But the way I like this is the kind of style that I've developed, and it's very simple. It's one directional, this happens to be daylight, coming from the side with a soft reflection on the, on the, on the uh, opposite side, moving out to black. And it's a simple technique, but if it's something that I've kind of mastered to this point, and it's something that I enjoy doing because it, it still speaks to me in using light and color this way. The yellow and the black, you know, the Steelers have that uniform for a reason, right? Yellow and black go really good together. And the Saints. And the Saints. That's right, I see your hat. <laughs> Who dat? Who dat? Who dat? <laughs> All right, but the idea of using these kind of contrasting colors, high contrast is something that appeals to me. It's not for everybody, but that's about style. It's about finding the style and the lighting techniques that you like. I'm happy to share them if they're the ones that you want to try to approach, but I also encourage you to try your own techniques. Find the color palette that you enjoy. Again, that light, right? Using that backlight, the way liquids reflect light and understanding how to play that in the camera and seeing it. Now, when you're using a steady light source, like daylight or an HMI light or, or something to that, or an LED that's not flashing, you have the ability to take your camera and look through it and then move your body or move your tripod and see the way the light is playing off of different objects, playing off of liquid, playing off of sh the shimmer and sheen. And when you find what you want, this is the, this is the benefit of shooting with steady light, then you can grab a shot like this, because now you know that when you're in this position, it's not only penetrating the liquid and making it glow, but you're also getting this incredible shine off the top. And that's, again, trial and error, figuring out in your space with your equipment where that light is going to come in to your room, or if you're, min if you're manufacturing that light, you have all that control. You can move your body and your camera. And this is why I shoot freehand a lot. I don't like to be locked down because a lot of times I don't find that right off the bat. I like to experiment with moving and finding the spot that I really want, the sweet spot for this particular um, setup. And the way light hits certain things, like brown is really hard. Brown is very, very hard. And being that chocolate is something that is so emotional for people. It's a challenge because you really want to portray chocolate in a way that's going to resonate with people. And a lot of times what that means is catching just a, just a glimpse of it, just a highlight, just finding that right balance of here comes the side light. I move my body just right here. If I put my camera here and I see that light bouncing the way I want it, that's my shot. And that's one of the tricks with using these kind of contrasting light and dark scenarios uh, to get a picture like that on a monochromatic surface. Especially all the darks, dark gold, dark, dark brown, light brown, black. You wouldn't think you can get that, but it's all about the highlight and that little bubble, of course. That tiny little bubble. Whoops. And then, it, well, like what I said earlier about, this is a combination of things, right? You have the combination of this kind of movement with the mayonnaise or aioli or whatever this is, and the penetration of light and then, of course, this kind of light shadow routine we got going on with the edge of the bowl. So we're going from, dark, from light to dark. So it's, it's all about white in this, right? It's, it's, it's variations on white. And white is, in, in like brown, is also can be very difficult to photograph 
because you have to be aware of the different tones and the fact that if you shoot it from a particular angle, it's going to flatten out and you're not going to have anything of beauty. But the beauty in this is shapes and light and the way light penetrates the subject. So again, I'm facing right into my light source. I probably have a tiny bit of build of light on the sides, but not to the camera side because I want that to come to shadow. So, and then this is a very bright environment, so it's still enough ambient light in the room to give me something on that front side so I have definition to the rim. So using the light and the shadow to your advantage. This is not daylight. This is a, this is a, a studio HMI that's basically just put, putting a very, very narrow beam of light right into the glass. And this is another kind of a, this was a lighting experiment that I was doing to see if I could get these bubbles to look like they were effervescent and glowing at the same time. So this is a light from the, now the left side of the frame and you could see where the highlights are. And that's a good trick to learn if you're, if you're at a beginning stage and you're learning about photography. A good experiment to do is try to figure out where the light source is. It's a very good kind of mental technique to figure out your own lighting, is to look at a picture and go, hmm, where's the lighting coming from? And this is clear that you have the hottest highlights on the left side, so that's where my light source is. And then I have some fill on one side, and everything else goes to black. So black is also good with glassware. Keep that in mind, because the black helps frame the outside of the glass. This is not exactly the right um, this isn't really about the glass, so the, the, we lose the edge of the glass. But if I, was try, if I were trying to shoot glassware, particularly against white, I would surround it with black cards because then the glass needs something to look at to create that edge. Like the other shot, you know, shooting white on white on white is, again, that challenge of trying to find a, the balance between lights and shadows. And it's also a good kind of experiment to undertake in as a photographer to kind of see how something that is monochromatic could have a lot of dynamic kind of presence on, on film. So having both shape here, color, and the way light and shadow play off those the movement of the food and the bowl and the positioning of the light source, all of that kind of comes into play to create definition and contrast. And that's, that's what your camera likes. You know, when you ever have trouble with your autofocus because it won't lock on, it's usually because there's no contrast. So by creating contrast in your composition, you're going to give your camera something to grab onto. So similar to the other shot with the honey. Using light, darks, extreme lights and extreme darks, backlighting, looking at the way light penetrates. This is all of kind of just more variations on that same theme is move your camera, move your light source, figure out a style that works for you and make it be something that you resonates for you. Because if it resonates for you, it should resonate for your audience. You've got, you, you should feel it. If you've, whenever you take a picture and you look at it and you go, eh, don't publish it. Don't put it on your blog. Don't put it on Instagram. Please don't put it on Instagram. <laughs> I joke, but it's important that if you're interested in photography as, and portraying yourself as a photographer and you're present in social media, you need to curate what you put out there in public. Because it's an, it is truly an, it's a, a living portfolio. And it's unlike anything we've ever had to deal with before as artists in that we're being judged uh, every day. So we need to be pre mindful that if we're putting things on our social media that aren't necessarily indicative of our skill as photographers. Now look, you want to put pictures of your dog and your cat and your friend and your fingernails, that's fine. But if you want to use it, as something, as a promotional tool for yourself as a photographer, curate it, just like you would your portfolio. Okay, developing a style. Like I said earlier, when you, I can hand you my camera with all the settings, everything set up, walk up to the table, this is what's in front of you, you take a picture. I do the same thing. I take the camera, I walk up, I take a picture. Those pictures are gonna be different. Not because I'm better than you are, or you're, or you're better than I am, but that's what style is about. It's about how you see something through a camera. Yes, camera settings and lighting techniques and all these things are part of developing a style, but firstly, it's about what you see, how you take pictures with your eyes. We do it all day. We walk down the street. 
we see pictures and we take them with our eyes. This is what Instagram has become in a lot of ways. It's about that vision that we have and you see people that you don't necessarily think of as artists making beautiful pictures because this is the way they see the world. And that's the difference in style, in that you can have all of the same variables as another artist and take a completely different picture because you see the world differently. And that's what's important about developing your style. My style, if, you haven't, if it hasn't emerged by now, I like to shoot bright color, popping contrast out of dark. This is one of the major techniques in what I've done in my career. The other one is that backlit style with that high shine and, and the kind of wraparound light. These are the two things that I've done and I do, I do best and better than the other things that I might do. And that's because it's where my comfort zone is and it's what I've kind of created this same kind of technique to use color and light to tell the story that I want to tell. But again, my style doesn't have to be your style. What your style has to be is something you believe in and something you've crafted and worked on. And that's important. So my style, it's pretty clear. This is, this is a very good example of something that is, doesn't have definition, isn't particularly beautiful. God knows what it is, <laughs> but it's a pretty compelling image. And it's really about the way light and my technique and style kind of come through here. And it's, it's important to understand that not everything you're going to take a picture of is going to be beautiful in food. It's going to be very challenging at times when you have something that isn't innately beautiful. But then that's where your style comes in. When you've crafted a style where people can recognize your photographs without the byline, that's when you know you've gotten to that point where you can make something compelling and interesting, maybe not necessarily beautiful, but definitely indicative of who you are as an artist, every time, consistently, day in and day out in any circumstance. That's what makes you a professional. If you can be relied upon to be consistent as a photographer, you will have clients. You will have people who will enjoy your work, hire you to do that work, buy your work, because you are consistent in a style that is appealing to a particular portion of the marketplace. And it's important that you stay consistent to that. Because when I look at a, I get the offer to come and review people's portfolios all the time. Because I do this type of work and because I'm, I'm accessible to people, they say, can you look at my work? And I'm happy to do it because I think people need to know what works and what doesn't work. And a lot of the times, the biggest problem is it's all over the map. And, when, and I've learned this from friends in more advertising than editorial. When they've come to me and said and helped me craft my website many years ago, it was like, do something well and show that you can do that thing. Because if you're shooting sports and you're shooting food and you're shooting people and you're shooting weddings and you're shooting your friends and you're shooting this and that, nobody knows what you're about anymore. Photography is about specialization. You have to be married to the idea that I'm shooting this. And then if you do that really well, you slowly creep out into the market and do a little bit more. So like what I said earlier, I'm real comfortable on that table but my future is further away from it because I have to gradually feel better about it. When I first started shooting a dozen years ago, I shot with a 100 millimeter macro lens and I shot things that were about as big as my thumb. And slowly but surely, I got further away, more comfortable with the overall design, set design, style that I was creating that I could translate that to any size. So that's what it's about. If you're finding like right now, I'm building my website, I'm trying to figure out where I belong. If your strength is food, just shoot food. Don't worry about people, lifestyle, this, that. Don't worry about it. Do one thing really well, then grow. Because otherwise, when people are looking at your website, they're gonna be like, doesn't know who he is. Doesn't know who she, she doesn't know who she is. And that's what's important to, to portray as a photographer in this space. Be something and be, be something very specific and do it well. So, more examples of style. But white, dark, light, 
Remember yesterday I told you that that's 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 that surface. That's JP's that's JP's wall. So you know, and that style obviously has a little bit of a diff that, that has variations in it, right? Is that sometimes I shoot with a little bit more depth of field, sometimes I shoot with a little less depth of field, but it still has the same sense that this is my work. It's it, there are little variations. It's not dramatic variations, but there's not a whole lot that those two particular lighting techniques that I've kind of become comfortable in, I can't do. I, I do them, and I do them pretty often. That doesn't mean I can't do other things, but yes, these are the things I'm comfortable in. So the, the chocolate, the little light, the little tiny fleck of, of, uh, of highlight, that I don't need to do much more than that in a, in a scenario like this because the, the, the subject matter tells the story for me. I put it in my style, you know, the, the idea of movement, dynamic, dynamic presence of food, highlighting, high contrast, put them all together in the little package, and this is still very, very indicative of what I do. Okay. Know the story, know the audience. So, I'm shooting for different magazines, I shoot for different newspaper, I shoot for a different client. You have to know what they want. Now, they came to you. They know they want your style, they want your particular skill set, but you still have to know how to tell that story that's appropriate. You can't just be locked in and say, I do it this way, and if you don't like it that way, then that's too bad, which is what you really want to say most of the time. But you have to be flexible. And I, honestly, a lot of it is about knowing the story or the storyboard or whatever it is that is the continuum of what you need to do with that camera. So this is very different than most of the stuff that I shoot, but it was about what the story was. The story was about homemade uh, hostess cupcakes, Twinkies, and things like that. So the idea of the food styling here was important in that we didn't want it to look too good. We wanted it to still look homemade, but still have a, a resonate the idea that that's what this is. And it was about giving this to your kids rather than the store-bought stuff and encouraging them to cook and encouraging them to eat this type of food that's homemade rather than this. So that's the story. So we know what the audience is. Who's the audience? Moms, right? Moms is the audience. Keep it light, keep it bright, keep it kitty, you know? Keep it a little kitschy maybe because this is, this is the audience that I'm, I'm shooting for now. So the styling and the lighting and all of it was all appropriate for the particular story we were trying to tell. And then, of course, adding people into that equation. And the whole story, again, is told. And this has nothing to do with my dark style or my, my you know, but it is about having the recognition to know when you have to shift your, your kind of equilibrium a little bit to tell the story that needs to be told. Know your audience. So this was a, this, I include this because this is his sister and uh, my godchildren, and this was a shot that I just grabbed one day, and I talk about this picture because what happens next? <laughs> that's right, and we all know it, <laughs> right? And that's the point, right, is that if my audience is parents, they know what's happening next, and somebody wasn't paying attention. <laughs> So that's, again, you know, knowing your audience. You grab a shot like this, you know exactly who that's going to resonate with. We are in a particularly dynamic and complicated art form because we could take the greatest image known to man. The, comp composite, the framing is beautiful. The lighting is beautiful. Everything is perfect, but the food looks horrible. <laughs> now what? It needs to be styled appropriately. Now, I'm not saying that you have to hire a professional food stylist, but if you are at the beginning part of your career and you want to shoot well-styled food and you're not a cook or a stylist, work with a chef. Go to restaurants, offer your services. Work with people who know how to craft a plate because food styling is essential to food photography. It has to look right. And 
if you don't have somebody that knows how to style a burger, it's not going to work. <laughs> and that frame is off. Shouldn't be cropped. At the, the picture is not cropped at the bottom. This is the limitations of computers. Um, yeah, question. How much of it was actually food after you do the. 100%. Mm -hmm. Every thing you've seen on this screen ended up in somebody's stomach. <laughs> Yours. Mm, sometimes. <laughs> but honestly, we, we, because of the volume of the work that we do at, at my studio, um, everyone in the building eats well. <laughs> we, have, we have a little uh, neighbor next door. She's this probably 65-year-old Japanese woman, lives alone with her pit bull. <laughs> and every day, I leave the door ajar, and the pit bull comes in. And he sits down in front of my prep table, and he likes the cheese rinds. He li and we give him the cheese rinds, and then we send a big bag. Of, and of course, I think she knows that when the dog comes in, the door is now open, and then she goes out with a bag full of food every day. So we, f we, feed, the, we feed the neighbors. But, you know, I have one particular stylist who worked on a TV show who is amazing at building burgers. She does it really well. And you'd be shocked because it's so iconic in our culture. You know, certain food items, we have an innate expectation of what they're supposed to look like. And if they don't come close, they don't resonate. They just don't. You, you, it just doesn't look right. And it's not the experience of going to the burger shop and biting the burger. It's not. It's born in advertising. It's born in where we've seen these images our whole lives. And if you don't get close to that, it just doesn't resonate emotionally, psychologically with your audience. And that's where food styling really comes into play. You know, something simple, monochromatic, but make it look homemade. I didn't want this to look like super slick. This was all about homemade. And then the crackling on the top, that happened on its own in the oven, but it's also something about recognizing good you know, the way food kind of has its ability to self-style sometimes, right? When you take something, you take something out of the oven, you're like, whoa, that's perfect, just the way it is, don't touch it, you know? And you have to make sure that the, the, you're capturing those things, and it's about that recognition sometimes, too. You get it, it comes out of the oven, it's perfect. But that's the same pie. Now, if that ham and, and egg and the other stuff isn't well-proportioned on the inside of that, and there's a certain skill to doing that ahead of time. If it's not well proportioned, it's not going to look right. It's going to look off balance. It's going to look like something's missing. So good food styling ultimately makes the picture. Now this one I'm particularly proud of because I made it. <laughs> I have one passion left when it comes to uh, working with food and its, ba it's baking. Uh, I do a lot of the baking still, when, when, even with, when I work with stylists, because it's something that I learned when I was young and I really enjoyed. This, this tart took three days to make. It's a, like a French technique of rolling out the dough, chilling, rolling, chilling, rolling, and then finally building and making. Um, so it was something that uh, I took a lot of great pains, including hand selecting just about every one of those raspberries. <laughs> after soaking them in ice water for 20 or 30 minutes. So there's a lot that goes into this type of stuff. But look, baked goods are very forgiving because we have an emotional connection to them. They make us happy. They make us feel good. We like them. They tap the pleasure center. So it's an easy, it's an easy fix when it comes to uh, food photography. It's one of the easiest things to photograph because you know your audience on the other end is, is going to be really enthusiastic about it. But then food styling can also take on the idea of using graphic, the graphic nature of food in placement and shape and color and using these things to create something that may be outs outside of the idea of delicious but interesting and graphic and artistic. And that's where food styling helps you too because this isn't real sexy. It's just not. I mean, I get it. Vegetables are good for us, right? Uh, right. <laughs> but they don't necessarily engender that emotion that a lot of other foods do. So when you have that kind of conundrum in front of you, you figure out a way sometimes to make something else happen. And that's where your artistic kind of 
um, instincts kick in, especially for stuff like this, these kind of overhead graphics that are also part of the style that I've kind of built over the years is I like this look. I like that overhead graphic look because, l let's face it, not everything's pretty. So you got to make it interesting. If you can't make it pretty, make it interesting. Now that's pretty and interesting. But, you know, the small details of this food, of the food styling, the placement, the, the size, all of that matters in food styling when it comes to food photography. These are raspberries and strawberries, but I carefully selected them by size to make sure that they didn't look incongruous with one another, that they blended together in a natural way. And that's important to understand is that sometimes you have to think three steps ahead to get to the final product. And choosing your ingredients is the first step in food styling and making sure they look fresh and they, and they don't look like, you know, they've been through the mill a few times, especially when you're going to shoot close up. And, you know, sometimes your food, like I said, it comes out of the oven, it doesn't need anything. Just build a set around it and it's beautiful. But, again, balance, symmetry, all of that happens in food styling because if all of the pecans are off to one side or you're not equally distributed with the, um, with the coconut, it's going to look odd. And it may not figure it out at first as a viewer, but you'll feel it. You'll feel it before you notice it. And you'll look at it and you're like, eh, that's not right. Because we're really attuned to things like symmetry and having a balance in the image. So it's important to understand that that happens with the food stylist or yourself if you're styling your own food. Okay. Camera settings is one of those questions I get a lot. I'll tell you right off the bat. 125th of a second, 4.0 at 100 ISO, 90% of the time. If I can get to those settings, I'm happy. I, uh, and then when I'm shooting from over, over the top, I'm shooting at eight instead of four because I want, I want more depth of field. And that's it. There's no, there's no science in my, you know, there's no secret. But, you know, understanding and recognizing the difference between this and that, the difference between eight and four, from over the top is important because it's going to tell the story differently. It's going to feel different to the viewer. It's going to guide your viewer in a different way. And having consistency in your camera settings is something that is essential to your style in that if you end developing, we talked earlier uh, about trends in food photography and this was the trend five years ago and now this is the trend. We have more depth of field in food photography now. We didn't have it five years ago. Everybody wanted to shoot super shallow with this kind of ethereal feel. And it was nice, but it, like everything else, it, you know, shifts with the times. And then, you know, you have something like this, which is a complete departure from the others, right? Because now this is strobe light and it's much, much sharper and cleaner and it gives a different feeling just based on camera settings and lighting technique. So, you know, lots of depth of field, super sharp because there's a lot more light in, in, the, in the subject. You know, all of that is about kind of getting familiar and comfortable with different camera settings to get different effects. So something that feels a little more romantic, a little softer, and then something that's much harder and much sharper, gives a different feel, a different emotion. It's got a different punch to it. And like that too. That's from the same shoot. But lots of detail, super sharp. Okay, propping. Now, I talked earlier about having a disease, about, shot, you know, about being a prop addict, and it's true. But it's also because we're kind of creating essentially these dioramas as food photographers. Three particular different artists can be on any given set, a prop stylist, a food stylist, and a photographer. Um, and those three people contributing together add to uh, the vision. And the this, this story being told a lot of times is being told with the propping. So when you have the idea in your mind as to what you want to tell, 
I want this to be warm. This is a hot toddy. I want it to feel wintry. I want it to have a little bit, I don't want it to be too uh, precious or perfect. I want it to feel a little loose. Uh, and the smoke lifting gives me that kind of, the smoke is a prop in this situation. But also the tray and the nutmeg and the, and the, the rind, food as props, also important to note. But you know, it's, you know, those little beaded handles, those kind of, in, it, it kind of invite you to grab one, you know? So it's, it's about letting the propping be as important, because if not, what is this image? It's orange liquid. There's nothing there. So it's all about building the set. It's all about telling the story through the propping. You know, and I got my kind of rustic looking cinnamon ro rolls, and, the, and the, the, the wood underneath doesn't feel too slick kind of feels rustic. It's on the wire. It's kind of still right out of the oven. It's not formalized. And that's another thing about food photography in general, as far as trends are concerned, is that we don't care where the fork and the knife go anymore. We don't eat with linen napkins and fine china. That's not what we do anymore. And food photography is reflecting culture in that way, is that we have become a lot less formal, but we are also kind of gravitating towards the important parts of food, which are ingredients, you know, and ingredient shots and things like that are become more important. Um, grandma's muffins or, or cheese biscuits or whatever, but it's the prop that tells you about the age, the, the patina of it, something that has some soul and has a history. And it's important to note that, you know, I could have put this in a, in a red rubber uh, silpat kind of cup, whatever it is, cupcake tin, but that doesn't tell my story for me. So when I'm in a prop shop or I'm in an antique store at a yard sale and I see this, immediately I build the story in my head. I'm like, oh, I know what I can use that for because eventually one day, and this is what you tell yourself, right? <laughs> eventually one day I'm going to need this. And, um, and then it ends up in the storage unit and hopefully one day you need it. But, you know, that very simple idea is the thing that the whole narrative is built around, and it's the prop. Same thing here, you know, food as props, props as props, that tiny little detail on the edge of the handle for the spoon, the teaspoon, the size matters. You know, you don't want, you, I wanted the muffin to look really uh, hearty, big inviting. So through perspective and the size of my propping, I have this big muffin and this tiny little cup of coffee in order of importance for this. All the details about food photography is this kind of, it all matters. There's nothing accidental here is what I mean. The placement of the food, the fact that it's on a, a sheet pan that's really weathered and beaten, the, the prop that I chose, the towel that I chose. There are no mistakes. And in, there's nothing haphazard about building a, a food image because all of the little details matter. And in order to get this right, this is a real uh, confluence of three artists, right? Propping, food styling, really important in this situation, and the photography. So being able to kind of, even if you don't do all three jobs, you need to be aware of them. You need to be able to guide them and direct them. Because if you're on a set and the propping doesn't feel right for you, you have to be able to communicate in a language that a prop stylist will understand why you want it to be different. What feel am I looking for? What emotion am I looking to tap into? What uh, narrative am I trying to tell? And if you kind of put your head in there, you're going to be able to um, at least conceptualize the jobs that are part of this art form. Um, details in sometimes unphotographable kind of subject matter where there's nothing there but bubbles and maybe a tiny little piece of fruit. Maybe that's all there is. But the reality is being able to focus in on very, very small details, make something out of nothing, uh, and not give up on something because you say, oh, it just, there's nothing there for me. I have nothing to hold on to. Find the smallest little detail that will help tell your story. And, you know, 
food styling here, but also the detail of the styling. You know, how it feels well styled without feeling like it was made in a bakery, right? And that was the, fe that was the idea in this. And there's more to this story too. This is about this particular um, photograph is for a book about cooking vegan food for your kids. So my goal was to make imagery that tapped into that audience. Again, right, we know our audience. My audience is about saying, I want to put this on my kids, but I don't want them to feel different than other kids, right? I want them to live the lifestyle I want them to live, but I still want them to have the same experience as I had. So this is silken tofu, not chocolate frosting. And I wanted it to feel like you can't tell the difference. And then the next image in the sequence in the book is a little boy licking the spoon, right? Because that's the experience that we uh, associate with making a cake with mom. And now that experience hasn't been diminished because it's not butter and sugar, okay? So that's, that was the goal and that was the audience. But the details mattered. The details of all of it had to feel like that same experience, the same experience that we had as children or even as adults with, with, with this type of food. Super macro photography is what I started doing. I still have a tendency to love it um, and finding those tiny, tiny little details in something and bringing them into a, into a perspective that you don't normally see. You know, this doesn't last long, right? You take it out, boop, pop it in your mouth, it's gone. We don't ever really stop to look at how beautiful it really is. So showing it that way has always been something that I enjoyed and finding those tiny little details. Finding contrast in something that is monochromatic. The nuts really help in breaking up the brown, showing shapes, giving me kind of architecture. All of those things are important in food photography because not, it's not always something that you're going to be able to make look desirable. And like I said, if it isn't beautiful, at least it could be interesting. And, you know, this is a play on the traditional chocolate chip cookie. And the whole idea of the story was about shaving the chocolate rather than putting chocolate chips in the cookies. So being able to highlight that particular detail, that small kind of consequential detail to the story was important in putting this together. Okay. All of this stuff I talk about is pretty serious in a way that artistically we're trying to put our heads around stuff, but you still have to have a sense of humor and let your personality come through. And sometimes it's just about how you photograph something. You know, making peeps and little bunnies for, for Easter was something I was having a hard time with because we couldn't get the shapes right, we couldn't, and I was getting frustrated. So I said, well, I'm just gonna have fun. And it turns out that, that when, when I just let go of that idea, that's what happens. Same thing with this picture. Now, I was forced to put this silly pinata in a picture for a book. So I decided to have fun with it because, quite honestly, it's ridiculous. But the idea is that once you let go of the idea, it's like, oh, I'm a serious artist, and I want to make beautiful pictures, and blah, 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 blah. This is the picture they wanted. This is the picture I gave them. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to... Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.